101's Dan Steinberg. We're thrilled to announce that we've teamed up with the Recording Academy's Music Care Foundation to do a little good. And you, our listeners, can help by going to promoter101.net and clicking on the merch tab at the top of the browser. And you can pick up a stylish, limited edition, brand new Promoter 101 Call Your Mother t shirt or hoodie. I'm modeling the hoodie right here. And of course, the t shirt can't be left out. Now, for a $20 donation, the t-shirt is yours. For $50, you can have the hoodie. We would greatly, greatly appreciate you helping some people in our music community that really do need your help. 100% of the proceeds donated will go to Music Cares. And at the same time, you'll score some brand new awesome swag. Now, it's all tax deductible. And what's better than that? And no additional cost. Shipping and handling is totally covered. It's all in. So donate by visiting our website, promoter101.net, and picking up a shirt or a hoodie, what have you. We offer many colors, styles, sizes. It's for a good cause. It's our first ever merch. We're very, very proud of it. And we're hoping that you will help us support Music Cares. Your donation supports Music Cares and their mission to provide a safety net of critical assistance for music people in their time of need. And for the first $10,000 we raise, Prism will match donations dollar for dollar. Be the heart and soul of the music community by donating to Music Cares. So you want to talk showbiz? Step right up. The Promoter 101 podcast is about to begin. That's right. Welcome to episode 181 of the Promoter 101 podcast. And we are keeping the UK sessions rolling as we featured Live Nation's executive president of Touring International, Mr. Phil Baldry on the podcast. Yeah, this is the first of our masterclass sessions, Luke. And does it deliver? It's a little bit longer than normal because there's just nothing that made the cutting room floor. It's just so good. These are MBA level classes here, Dan? They are. And we've got a bunch of them coming up. There's some master classes that we will identify as the master class sessions. And are they ever next level? I'm looking forward to those. What else we got in the podcast, Dan? A War Story with AEG Presents Chuck Morris. Coming in from the Rocky Mountains. I'm sure that'll be a good one. Episode 181 of Promoter 101 starts right now. Hi there. My name is Gary Spivak. I am the executive VP, head of talent at Danny Wimmer Presents DWP, and you are listening to Promoter 101. Have you missed any of the past Promoter 101 episodes? Well, hey, lucky for you, we've got them for you. Saved at Promoter101.com. All you have to do is pop on there and look through some of the past episodes, choose the one you want, and take a listen. It's just that easy. We recommend this week in particular, episode 105. Quite a tasty little dish that was. We had Live Nation Canada is President Paul Haggison giving us a glimpse of business in the Great North. AEG Northwest Regional Marketing Director at the time, Andy Rowe, talks cutting his teeth in the business, managing the dam, and overseeing marketing for Bumper Shoot. Quite a career. Plus a war story with author Larry Butler talking about Tommy Shaw of Sticks. And if you like that, let us know. If you've got a free minute, please drop us a review or subscribe to the podcast. It's easy. Tell your friends about us. Hey, this is Michael McDonald with Mick Management, and you are on Promoter 101. News of the week. What in the world is happening in the world of music, Mr. Pierce? It's time for News of the Week. An editor's note here, folks, because last week on this podcast, we said that this week we would have the dish on our final guest, Promoter 101. That's right, the guest that will be joining us on the dais at AIBA on October 27th. However, out of respect for AIBA and an attempt to coordinate some important announcements during this labor holiday week, we're holding out a bit here. Stay tuned for some updates. We will have the announcement of our guest. We're very excited. And now back to news of the week from Music City. On Wednesday, the Country Music Association announced its 2019 CMA Award nominees. 
Select categories were first announced on Good Morning America, and the remaining categories were revealed during a live stream via Billboard. Marin Morris tops the list of finalists with six nominations, followed by Brothers Osborne, who received four nominations, the second most nominations this year. Eleven artists garnered three nominations. Those include Dirks Bentley, Eric Church, Luke Combs, Dan and Shea, Scott Hendricks, Dan Huff, Greg Kirsten, Casey Musgraves, Blake Shelton, Chris Stapleton, and Carrie Underwood. For the night's highest honor, the reigning entertainer of the year, Keith Urban, is nominated again in the category alongside Garth Brooks, Eric Church, Chris Stapleton, and Carrie Underwood. For album of the year, Center Point Road by Thomas Rhett, Cry Pretty from Carrie Underwood, the self-titled Dan and Jay album, Desperate Man by Eric Church, and Girl by Marin Morris will be up for contention later this November. Senators Richard Blumenthal and Navy Klobuchar have called to look into Live Nation. The senators asked the Department of Justice to investigate the ticketing industry, citing serious concerns that online ticket markets are not working for American consumers. On the other side of the world, Tencent Music Entertainment Group is currently under an investigation by China's antitrust authority. This according to a report by Bloomberg. This puts the exclusive licensing deals with some of the world's biggest labels in jeopardy for the publicly traded company. China's State Administration of Market Regulation launched the investigation in January, looking into Tencent's deals with Warner Music, Universal Music, and Sony Music Entertainment Groups. According to the report by Bloomberg, the big three sold exclusive rights to a major chunk of their music catalogs, which then sublicenses that content to smaller rivals. They're arguing that such sublicenses is anti-competitive behavior. Bloomberg sources stated that it can be twice as expensive for Tencent competitors like ByteDance or Alibaba to license music for the rest of the world compared to its competitor in Tencent. Tencent Music is also the home of three of Chinese leading music service, QQ Music, Kuo Music, and Kuo Music. That'll do it for News of the Week. Hi, it's Paula Palazzo from Live Nation Concerts Canada on Promoter 101. Kicking it off on episode 181 of Promoter 101, we have a war story all the way from AEG Presents Rocky Mountains. Joining us now on the podcast, Mr. Chuck Morris. We've got some history with Chuck Morris. You got a Steve Martin story? I have a lot of Steve Martin stories. He lived in Aspen for a long time in the 70s. First met him because he was the opening act with the Dirt Band because him and John McCune went to high school together. And he actually broke and got his chops together by opening for the Dirt Band for about two and a half years. But he played New Year's Eve 1975 at Ebbets Field, my club. And it was a blizzard, terrible snowstorm, sold out. He was already very, very big. And at the end of the show, he asked everybody to follow him across the street to a coffee shop and get everybody coffee before they went home. So 275 people followed him. And he had his balloons on and his glasses. He was directing traffic because it was so bad that the road, going a block across the street to a diner, to get coffee for 265 people following him. It was the sickest scene you've ever seen. And he wasn't that well-known. I mean, he was well-known that he sold out every rock club in America. Before the jerk in Saturday Night Live, he was selling out rock clubs, but he was in a household name. And he's directing traffic, and a cop car pulls up, puts their siren on, because they think this is nutcase. <laughs> they can't figure it out. And they started quizzing him, and these people are all walking across the street with him directing. And thank God the cops knew me owning the club, Evans Field. And I said, he's a comedian. This is like a shtick. And so they left. It was funny. And he went across the street to the diner and ordered 270 coffees, half with cream, paid for all of them. The <laughs> funniest thing ever. <laughs> Did they know he was coming? Were they ready for 270 cups of coffee? No. <laughs> that no. had to be the scariest and, and thing that paid, coffee shop. he paid for them all. <laughs> He did that at other clubs on that run and did things silly at the end of the shows. How cool is that? Well, Steve was, is and was brilliant. Now, how about the people of Colorado that come out during a blizzard anyway? Because it's Colorado and they deal with it. You want to see entertainment? Hey, I'll tell you one it. quick story. We started Winter on the Rocks, which is we do one show during the ski convention at Red Rocks in the middle of the winter. And I got that idea 20 years ago. I went to a Green Bay Packer Bronco game in a blizzard at Mile High Stadium, right? They announced 88 no-shows. I said to myself, 88 people with no-shows in a blizzard. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I said, rock kids could go. And, and in those days, they would mothball Red Rocks. So the city wasn't crazy about doing a winter show. And it took us about 10 years, and it's been doing great. It's amazing. Yeah. Chuck is an absolute icon in the business. We'll have a filthy interview coming up with him in just a couple of weeks. This is Omar Ajelani from Live Nation, and you're listening to Promoter 101. Promoter 
101 Flashbacks. Episode 67. Jason Flom. You know, the, what hasn't changed is magic, right? It's magic. If you're lucky enough to bump into, uh, you know, an artist with that amazing ability. And at the end of the day, it's all about the artist, right? I mean, we're here to service them. It's their talent. It still takes a team and it takes a, a real push. Um, by the way, I just reminded myself of an incredible story. I saw David Geffen introduced Amit one time at an event. And David is, to me, a, he's like a deity. I mean, the guy is like, he's so next level. So, of course, I was hanging on every word. And David introduced Amit. And he, he, t- he told the story about how when he was a kid in the business, he said to Amit one day, he said, Amit, I want to become a big success like you. Like, can you give me any advice? And Amit goes, hey, kid, walk around with your head down. Maybe you'll bump into a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking incredible. I hope that story is true, but it doesn't even matter. It's so good. So and to hear David tell it, of course, is magical. But what hasn't changed is if you can find great artists and you can put a serious effort behind it, it'll still work. And, you know, the business will always change. It'll always evolve. What will never change is that people always want new talent and the best talent always wins. I mean, that's what happens. Like I totally believe that the cream rises to the top. Hi, this is Nareet Smith from the House of Blues Music Forward Foundation, and I'm on Promoter 101. Tweet. Tweet. Tweets of the week. I hope you're ready. Hike up your britches. It's time for some tweets of the week. Let's start here. When an agent starts the day with my favorite game, can I slide this past the promoter? So it's going to be that kind of day. Got it. How about this? Maybe a Promoter 101 tweet, maybe just a thought from Dan. What part of the chicken does the nugget come from? I have taken anatomy in school, and I don't remember the nugget on the diagram, Luke. I just can't find the fucker. (laughs) I like this one, Dan. I found the balance between overwhelmed and underwhelmed. Yep, I'm just whelmed. (laughs) That'll just about do it for Tweets of the Week. Make sure you keep up with Dan on Twitter. He is at the Jew. And you can follow Luke at W. Luke Pierce. The W is very important, otherwise you get a whole nother Pierce. I'm Ralph James from UTA, and you are listening to Promoter 101. We are very excited to continue our UK sessions this week on Promoter 101. We are rolling through some amazing interviews, and today is no exception. This is the first of some Masterclass podcasts. They will be a little bit longer than you're usually used to. There's not much left on the cutting room floor in this because this interview was so good. He's a master. This is post-grad shit, kids. Listen up. Joining us now on the podcast, Live Nation Executive President of Touring International, Mr. Phil Bowdry. Phil Bowdry, thank you so much for taking time. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for coming and making the time for me in your big European trip. I'm having a ball here. I always love coming over. You guys have really created one hell of a company over here in the UK and all throughout Europe, you guys are really crushing business right now. Yeah, things are great at the moment. Really working through and we have some great teams in every European city and obviously London being one of the major ones. So you're part of the shop is touring. Yes. So you oversee a lot of the stuff when it comes through leg wise and overseeing the big runs throughout. You're part of the world tour team, obviously, with stuff. And then when you're just buying tours for European legs, what have you. Yes. You're the guy in a lot of that stuff. We work with our friends in the US and put those Pan American tours in. Or if I'm doing Europe with other our European offices, then I'll run it from here as well. If it's a leg that's not even working in the US, if it's just starting here, then I'll put it together with our European offices. What are some of the things you're working on right now? I mean, looking through the office, you can see a huge Justin Timberlake, a Madonna, a U2, Taylor Swift. Yeah. It's, it's insane. Yeah. Genesis. Like, just looking around, and that's just the police. It just, yes. It's the Hall of Fame in here. <laughs> yes. I enjoy looking at them and having some great memories from all of them. For instance, on a European field at the moment, I'm just talking to Craig Fruin about Jeff Lynn's ELO. We successfully put Jeff through Europe two years ago or 18 months ago, 26 dates. We're looking, I don't think we'll do that again, but looking at what we can do with a new album and everything that's coming with him. So that's driven from here into Europe in that way, rather than America. I saw that tour a couple of weeks ago in Tacoma. It was incredible. Yes, I I popped in, I was in New York recently and I popped over to the Prudential Center in Newark, saw Jeff and Craig and saw the show again there. Doing very well. That's an amazing show. It's so weird that he stayed away for so long. I don't think it was a marketing plan to stay away that long, but it definitely helped build the hype. Oh, it's just the catalog. I mean, when you look at the set list, every single song, but there's still 
a truckload of songs that he's not even playing that you would say, ah, I, you know every song. It's an amazing list. The guy was a traveling Wilbury, for Abs- God's sake. Absolutely. And does one of the traveling Wilbury songs, as you well know. Yes. With Danny Harrison, who's out on the tour with him this one. Whose idea was it to put Danny on that tour? Because that's genius. That would have been Jeff, I think. That was really a great move. And that could really catapult his career because those people that come to a ELO show most likely aren't going to find too much new music. Right. But they probably would be very open to being a Danny Harrison fan. Yeah, to listen to. Absolutely. It gives it that platform and that's where it is. I think that was Jeff's intention. It's a great runway. Yeah. And it's kind of hard because there's very few acts that you could put in front of that that would make sense. Yeah. It'd have to be a Shell Crow level act that has a catalog that that audience would understand. What we do on two tours here, just getting into that special guest scenario, we used the feeling on one of the tours because it was a, a nice pop feel to it. When he played Wembley Stadium, I, we put Tom from Keen on as well as a, as a solo artist. So he sported, and then we had the Shires, and if you're aware of those, but the Shires are a duo that are slightly lean towards country, but obviously aesthetically really good. And we had a great bill for Wembley Stadium. When you're building shows like that for Wembley, whether it's ELO or anyone else, yep. when you're going from an arena and popping into a stadium and supersizing the bill to make sure you're selling those tickets, absolutely, the pressure's on. Yes. And taking an act that would normally headline as a support thing and playing that ego game and making sure it all works and trying to find somebody that is so excited to play with a headliner like that, that they're willing to give up their ego and take that middle slot. That's got to take a lot of negotiation and back and forth. Yeah, and that, that's the job, right? It's exactly. And hopefully you've got a manager that sitting there sees the long term of that, the benefits, the record company, all of those people, even if the artist is in somewhat a quandary of do I do this or not? There will be some people saying, come on, just think about what it does. It's another, uh, for Jeff, for instance, we had 60,000 people in Wembley Stadium. So that's, you know, it's a lot of people seeing, uh, I'm not saying that any of them wouldn't have seen that artist before, but it just puts a, a big insurance thing that they are seeing. It puts it on another level for them. Now, you just said a word I don't hear very often from concert promoters, the record label. Yes. I haven't heard that word come out of a concert promoter's mouth in like 20 years. No. But with the the level of action, you're not doing many club shows. Well, Live no. Nation has that department here. Yes, that's we handled do. Locally. We do. And we're looking at up and coming acts all of the time. Absolutely. But that's not your post here. No, not at all. Not taking that away from Live Nation UK, which is certainly building those acts all across Europe. Yep. But that's not what you do at this point. You work with the bigger acts and the yep. bigger tours. And in those cases, the record labels are actually still selling records and still involved. It's yes. That level of arena and stadium and festival headliners. Yep. But they're looking for the up and coming stuff as well. So it's nice to talk to them, especially if you can have a relationship with the record labels, because they're seeing stuff. We're seeing stuff. You can, you can trade it off. It's all about the same thing. It's all about music. And they are becoming not the force that they were before it was you toured to promote your album. Now you you tour to look after yourself and the record company are there as well to make sure that the product is new and turned over and everyone's going together. But they are now becoming more of a force than they have been in the last few years. It's certainly changed the world quite a bit on how that plays and the priority in the course of both of our careers of everything started with the label and now kind of everything starts with the tour exactly but but look at all the the, the way that music is coming out now with the, the kids don't even need a label in some instances they're just putting it out themselves and getting that groundswell working for them there's acts that are actually playing arenas that are not signed to a label so at that point they're looking for a label labels are trying to get them instead of going to the club to see them they're going to the arena to see them just by way of what they're doing. And the internet's changed the game completely. Exactly. exactly. All right. So we'll come back to the arenas and the stadium acts yep. in a minute, which is clearly where you're making most of your hay at the moment. Yep. But let's talk about how you found music. You were a musician. Yes. Not a great one, but I was a musician. I was Does a drummer. Did that go back to before university? or? Oh, yeah. Uh, I did the University of Life, Dan. I left school at something like 15, 16, uh, went on the road. And you didn't go back? No. Wow, I was not aware of that. I'm not saying I'm proud of that, but it, it just it's one of those things I say to my kids, don't do as I do, do as I say. I was very fortunate, blessed, all of those things that you would sit there and, and, and look at it and, okay, how, how did I get through this? I was very lucky 
got through it, the right breaks, right people, everything just worked for me. And it's been a dream since then, since leaving. But I, I, I was a drummer in a band, not, uh, not great, and decided I preferred the, uh, the other side, the organization. I started to become a roadie at uh, 16. And for anybody uh, notable? They were a known act here. They had the success. By the time I was 18, we'd had a couple of number ones. It was a pop band called Mud, M-U-D. And yeah, I broke everything in working on that and getting the hit records, number ones. So I saw the one side of how it works, working live, doing the European tours. So I was on a bus tour when I was 17, which was a regular sit up and beg bus. You know, we, we were doing They long, didn't have the, the no, sleepers. No, 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 no. And you were lucky if it actually made a journey without breaking down. And there were six or seven of us on there. Now that was a, you know, that was a big deal. Six or seven guys on being the gear in. Which is a great way to learn the business, yeah. by the way. Every market, you know what the drives are. You know how long it is you load in has to be at each venue and which one's more difficult. What a great way to know how to route a tour better than living in the bus and going exactly. from market to market. It's the learning, the process, and, and it was a great school for me, yeah. And tour in America. I was touring America when I was 17 and a half, 18. With mud? No, mud didn't make it in America. I actually did some shows with Charles Aznavour, oh, okay. French-Armenian singer, and I went out as a sound engineer. Did a couple of tours with him. I mean, my first city in the States was Los Angeles. Uh, I arrived there when I was 17 and a half, flew in. We, we did the show that night at Pentages. You flew and play on the same day? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was one particular on that tour. We were playing Miami the night before. And obviously, we were flying commercial at that point. You didn't do anything else. And I remember leaving Miami very early in the morning. We were playing Carnegie Hall that night. And I was sat at the sound desk in Carnegie Hall. So a four and a half hour flight, maybe even longer back yeah. then. I woke up at the desk while the show was on wondering, oh, shit how long have i been asleep but didn't seem to be any problems i looked around and everything was still going you know you just it was fatigue nothing else right that was the night first night i met patrick stansfield came into the uh, backstage at carnegie <laughs> so i was 17 year old kid seeing that larger than life chap that he was a uh, legend in his own bathroom you just running across america absolutely airport to airport airport to airport cutting it close see those are some major jumps I mean, we were, most of the stuff was being supplied but we still had to put you know that stuff that was being supplied we still had to put it together so it was uh it was quite interesting but that, that's you know learning those things second tour i did of america was a band called renaissance or renaissance yeah they're still around yeah kind of a prog esque math yeah, exactly. kind of band and on the east coast particularly in the you know the universities and things and the campuses they were huge news and the midwest i did quite a few tours and i, I actually worked for john Sher at that point a monarch entertainment and obviously he was looking after the dead at that point so that was a a very big eye opener seeing all of those things because they were touring at that point jerry garcia and all those well that guys. had to be an interesting thing too because jam never really broke over here no i mean i know that some of the bands took shots at it and they did some passes but it never really caught i mean no. even dave matthews is what ten thousand tickets over here yeah but yeah. just in london yeah like none of the supporting cities no, you, you you'd you'd have to try and do london and try and maybe uh, the theaters do, or cut down exactly. everywhere else right yeah even the biggest of the like fish is not on the charts here did the almonds ever kind of break here? Uh, yeah, in a musical way, for sure. The connoisseur of music likes the Almond Brothers, absolutely. Fillmore East kind of vibe. Seems yes. like it would transfer over very well to London. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, in, in those early days of Steely Dan and things like that, which, yes, Countdown to a Thrill did break, of course. But there was still a musician's club looking at all those bands, just little feet, and all, just looking at it and saying, oh. Oh, these guys can play. You know, that was the, that was the whole thing. I love listening to that stuff. And in the past, we've had people like Carl Layton Pope on the podcast talking about how bands like Styx and Journey and REO just didn't put the time in to break these markets because it was just so expensive to invest and they were just worth so much more in the States. Exactly. They never really well, came you over. You can't knock them because if that opportunity is there in America or in their own territories then it takes a lot to look at it and say okay guys you got a choice you go and maybe spend money by going here to try to try and break this territory and there's, there's no guarantee that you are going to break it or you stay home and you make money in a guaranteed market and you know it's a big decision because especially when people have families and everything else it's something there there are the the loners yes that no nope, uh, all costs i want to keep trying i want to keep trying but it's a difficult decision now, it seems to me that there would be less competition in the market if there were amphitheaters over here. And I hear constantly from the UK promoters, there's a land issue, there's 
It, it wouldn't work. There's a weather issue, I think. <laughs> sure. Well, we got weather in Seattle. So. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I think you build the pavilions out now, which yeah, is something yeah, we've learned to do that, right? Alone, yep. But it seems that no one would benefit more from an amphitheater system existing in Europe than maybe you. Yes. We have a similar sort of summer market with what we would call castles and grand houses or... And you guys build a lot of these things out, right? Yes. You know, you go and take a stately home and you use the stately home as the backdrop, put a stage in front of it, work on a three-day bill. So that obviously you need two to work. One doesn't necessarily have to work because the two, the amortization helps you. Uh, where you have the problem is if only one works and then, of course, the two going right, against the it, it, yeah, it, does, it doesn't help. But there is a nice little tour. I mean, I, I have Tom Jones out doing a European tour at the moment. Uh, he's doing 32 dates in Europe. Now, is that arenas or is that no, theaters? it's all outdoors. Okay. He played a race course the other night in Newbury, 22,000 people at the race course. Was there a race affiliated with that? They have races during the, the day, and then they they everyone stays and they Okay, play so it's the, one ticket. Yes. So Tom there Jones didn't necessarily do 22,000. It was no, the combination. No, but, that's, but he, 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 it's the value. Got it. You've got it. You can go. But he played Dundee the other night in Cessna Gardens. There was 11,000 people, which is a cap. Hunted that's down. sold out. On Saturday night, safe to say Tom Jones is a bigger act in Europe than he is in the states. Uh, Holy yeah, shit. Yeah, but we we did a we did a small American tour in May this year. He he was at uh, Stagecoach. Oh yeah, and we did the Palomino stage. He headlined the Palomino stage on the Sunday night, which was great. And he did the New Orleans Jazz Fest. I went to Scranton in California. I'd never been there, so that was quite interesting. This still does well in America. We have we have a business. He he's on the voice here in the UK. He does the voice. Uh, he's so a judge. That's, which is uh, the coach, which is very strong for him here. So his audience has just gone from, you know, it's so wide now because the kids, oh that's Tom from the TV. It's it uh, it's lovely. It's and he's such a great singer. You know, works well. Now there are a lot of promoters in the UK. There's probably more competition in this yep. market. And I'm not talking about club promoters. I'm talking about people that can do stadiums and arenas. And Absolutely. There's a network. You guys have uh, an association. And there's, what, 60-some members of this? Must thing. be, yep. I it's have, insane. Uh, it's, at last count, being the chairman of the CPA, we had 59 members. What does CPA stand for? Concert Promoters Association. Okay, that's pretty fucking simple. <laughs> Okay, and you're the chairman, so yes. clearly uh, you get you you you're working with all these guys and getting along with them. Yes, trying to. Everybody's trying to play friendly. We always play friendly because we're going for the common cause. We may be competitors, but if something affects all of us, then that's when you all join together. It's 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 business. There's there's nothing personal about that. That's that's hey, we better make sure that uh, all these things work for everyone, and we try to make sure it's a level playing field. No, we, we skipped. We were, you were a roadie. Yeah. You went to America. Yeah. You were doing big shows and falling asleep at the bar. <laughs> that was one show. <laughs> okay. Let's, but let's pick up from there because clearly you didn't stop with the road. How did you find yourself on, on the concert promoter side of things? Obviously doing, working through, coming back to uh, the band that I talked about that I was with in the UK, Mud, getting more of a, a feel of not necessarily being the road manager, being more of a tour manager which is that's how that role evolved there was uh, there wasn't production managers i said before at that time it was just guys that the head roadie used to put the to make the decisions and push it around the tour manager had normally a, a good relationship with management so they were always working together so i had sort of progressed through that and then got very interested in the management side with a few artists that were around and then found a uh, one of the acts of being promoted by the a promoter here in the UK called MAM, which was the first promoting company that actually went public. That was run by Gordon Mills and uh, Barry Clayman, Colin Berlin. This is all off the Tom Jones. Ingram Barry Army. Clayman, that sound, name sounds familiar. Yeah, too. Well, Barry's, Barry's still here, with right? us. Still, still with us here. Part of Live Nation now, right? Absolutely. Still my... My mentor, still uh, someone that I would still make a phone call and talk to. He's, he emailed me this morning and asked me if I was in next week because he's going to be in London. Could we get together? And, you know, and that's, that's exactly what we'll do. Looking at that, seeing how that worked, watching the way things were done, I became a rep for them, started work uh, looking after their tours and their artists. I was doing a Leo Sayer tour 
spent eight years with Leo, uh, being his tour manager plus his uh, all. So now you've made it all the way up to tour manager. Exactly. I'm now working through it. Settling dates. Settling dates, looking at everything, watching it, checking the box office, doing those things. So learning uh, the trade of how you do it, especially for the rep, that was always the one thing you did. You walked into the building in the morning and said, could we just imagine that I'm settling now so you can give me a box office return now so that I can look at it? And then when it comes to tonight, in theory, all we have to do is add what we've sold today and then we can carry it. Because obviously it was never about computers. A lot of that stuff was still being tickets that were being turned right. out of the book. And then working through, Leo uh, decided to come off the road, wasn't going to work. So I went back to Barry Clayman and then became uh, working for BCC, which Barry had left MAM, formed his own company. And that's where I started promoting First tour that I promoted was John Denver. Barry promoted him for a very long time, but gave it to me. And you promoted to the UK? Yes, just the UK. But worked with John, which was great, and then found some other artists, domestic artists in the UK that promoted, you know, the marketing side, all of those things that I'd been watched, listened, been taught. You still need to be doing it yourself. You can't. That sort of thing is not something that is taught, handed down. You just have to take it in. You have to see, ah, okay, that's better for that. That act works better if I advertise there. It's you, you, you learn by your mistakes. You find all of those things out. Barry was very good and uh, gave me that uh, schooling, if you like, for want of a better word, but just, just made watched over so that everything I was doing, yep, he agreed or disagreed. Then we'd talk about it. I wouldn't say no, just say, is it, have you thought about this? Well, so I had a, I had a great, uh, a great learning curve through that period with him. That's very cool. The uh, whole concept of actually just getting in there and learning how to do it. Yeah. Because it's a different set of skills when you're on the road in the venue yep. opposed to when you're in the office and figuring out how to get people to be aware of the show, how to cut the deal. It's yep. one thing to settle the show. Yep. Actually, it's probably a great way to learn how to settle the show as a promoter is being on the other side settling for Set the act. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, if you know how to do one, you can probably do the other. Was there a time, because that was a sketchier time in the business, where yeah, the settlements course. were, well, they were rougher, I imagine? I, was, than- <laughs> I can remember putting budgets and things together, literally with a pencil and a, and a calculator. And then if you wanted to change something, oh, shit, you had to rub it out, start again. That's how you did all, try to work on your ticket prices. When, I, when computers first became uh, around, I remember having the, the Mac, uh, the first Mac, and actually built my own spreadsheet for a, a show, a costing, and sat with Barry and said, look, if we do this, we can change the ticket price. It, it changes the bottom line. And he was, I think he sat there for an hour with me, just kept making me change ticket prices. Just to he, watch it? He, just to watch. He wanted to see what he did, where the percentages were. So th- th- we didn't have that facility. Pre-excel. Exactly. And and getting that together and do that that changed and obviously when well it also changed the fact that because you used to have to call the agents and go over the the expenses yes or and at some point you telex them over or you fax them over good old telex machine right but it was harder for them to get a competing offer because everybody had to put so much in so maybe they might for a big show they might have had a competing offer but now they might have seven eight nine offers back in the nine times out of ten if you got the phone call and you sent the offer. You may haggle a little bit, but you're probably getting the show. Yeah. If you got the avail, you're probably getting <laughs> if the you're date. you're holding the date, you got it. Right. So, But even though it's gotten easier to build an offer yep. because of technology, it's also gotten easier for them to get competing offers. Of course. Because it took so much more time to get offers back yep. then. Yep. And, you know, they're looking at it instantly. They're comparing all of those offers and seeing exactly where the differences are, if there are any. And, you know, some people may have different uh, thoughts on the prices because really the ticket price is the basic costs are going to be the same. They're all basically the same, right? Whatever you're going to do. I mean, if some tours are big, you know they are, so your costs are going to be heavy just because they use more local, more, more, you know, more catering, more if there's more people. Right, but it's not like we're buying fuel from a different place. But where you're going to win is judging that ticket price, is getting that ticket price right. And, and there's, I'm not talking about making sure you're the highest, because sometimes... If, That's supply and demand. You exactly. want to make sure you've got the best, so you're selling the most tickets with exactly. the gross revenue for the dollar put yeah. out. And that, and that is where the, the skill comes in. Once you've done that, then it's the marketing side. You have to just make sure that you're getting to the right people who want to buy or are going to buy your tickets. If they don't know about the show, they're not coming. So it's, uh, it's that whole 
dilemma of, of, of once you get it, that's how you got to put it forward. You constantly hear the argument where the fan says they didn't know about the show. There's a limited amount of money you can spend to market a show. You can't find everyone. We're not a movie where we can advertise for months on end and hope we collect on 2,000 performances or screenings. Yeah. So when you hear somebody say, and they always say it to the musician right in front of you, right? So you look like <laughs> the asshole. I saw no posters. <laughs> I didn't even know the show was coming. Exactly. <laughs> Like what goes yeah. through your mind when you hear well, that? Because it's kind of uh, hard to com- combat with your it, budget, right? Yeah, it's. I mean, at some point, it's diminishing returns. Yes. Yeah, for sure. There are shows where you might think, "Oh, geez, we've thrown so much at this, and it just hasn't moved the needle." Are we better off to cut our losses? I can honestly say uh, that has so rarely happened to me because I believe I, I don't want to give in. I have that thing in me. I've got to try and make sure that I've eked every single ticket out. Sure. I've had plenty of shows that you put up and they sell out immediately. That's that's a nice feeling. But you, you really, until the day of the show, you, your job is done. The ones where you have to put the work in is the one that you're going to learn more and do more of your, get more of your skills. A classic example is when I was going around Europe, some of our offices in the early days, and saying to my question to them, how many local shows, how many domestic shows are you doing? And it, be surprised to be told, well, not not a lot, really. They're, they're waiting for the big show. So he says, yeah, but think about it. If, if you took the domestic shows, not only are the guarantees and things going to be much lower, but all of your people in the office, they're going to get the skills of selling a show. You're going to be able to sell it so that when the big one comes along, you'll be able to do it that you're going to be better. able to do it. And, and instead of dealing with a $600,000 guarantee, you're dealing with a $5,000 guarantee. That's that's not so hard to lose. That's, or that's even a, a 75000 whatever. Exactly. Whatever it is, don't dismiss the, the, the domestic market, local market. You've got to be doing those things all the time because that's how you find where you're doing the best. Plus, the that's best how you avenues. build the next act. Exactly. I went off course slightly, but that's that to me, that's it's about honing those skills, getting it because it, you can have that local act, what you're doing there, it will work for another act as well. It, it always does. It, it's finding new ways of selling that ticket because you need to sell the ticket. That's genius too, because when you get them in the room, they can see all the posters for the upcoming shows against the wall <laughs> and you got them coming back because that was before we had their email addresses. Exactly. It was before there was email. Yes. Okay. So what was the first tour you wound up putting together? On a European basis? I mean, I put a Fleetwood Mac tour together which obviously was all of Europe as well. How big was Fleetwood Mac when you first brought him over? Oh, were you playing it, theaters? It was, no, no, no. This was the incarnation of Fleetwood with Lindsay, with you know Mick, John, uh, Stevie. Not, not even uh, Christine was back with them at this point. She, she still, uh, she still wasn't playing with them. So it was the sort of rumors type. Act uh, okay. Together. It wasn't the early days. This no, is, this not is... not the real early got days. It, no. Got it. Got it. Got no. it. So they were already yes, they were already fluent. Man. Yeah, got absolutely. It. Okay. I was trying to think of uh, acts because there's so many of them. That's the trouble to getting to uh, remember which ones you did the whole thing on. Well, what's really funny is in the UK, it seems like most of the promoters promote in most of the country. It's not so much a local promoter in each market. And I'm not sure how long it's been, but in the states. There may be regional promoters, but there are very few promoters that do the entire, entire country. country. Yeah. But you, and I realize it's a smaller country. Yeah, it's, um, there's a bigger scale, obviously, of things. But all of your competitors can throw a tour offer in, it seems, or most of them. Yep. It seems like if you're not sending for the whole tour, you're not playing the game at the right scale over here. It's almost required. There are a few agents that like to use certain promoters in certain cities. They will cut an act up maybe between four. Because they, they want to make sure that every, not only everyone is getting a piece of what they're doing. I'm, I don't necessarily agree with that because I always believe that a marketing side, you can have four different ways and it's, a, a, it's not really, there's no consistency, there's no continuity to it, to how you're doing. So you're doing. big on the franchising out and doing everything the same in each yes, office well, and replicating just, success. Exactly. I mean, even if I do co-pros, which I, I do you know, enough with Simon Moran, for instance. Simon and I will decide who's actually going to do what in as much as if it's a tour that we're co-promoting, I'll, I'll do the tour or Simon will do the tour. We don't, we, we talk, but that one person actually runs the tour rather than trying to get any Not confusion. too many cooks in the kitchen. Exactly. It's uh, find that a, a good way of working. Obviously, it's real easy to have trust in Simon. He's got a skilled team. Yes. 
Very good. It's probably uh, one of those things you learn over time of who you trust and who you don't. Yeah. Because uh, I can't I mean, imagine everybody is Simon Moran over here. No. I imagine there's a couple no, where you're no, like, no, I'd rather... Thankfully, there's, there's not too many that are not Simon. Um, in fact, I think the, the business is, as you know, the checks and balances are so stringent now that that side of it is, is, is really almost but gone. But there are promoters that you like to work with, for sure. All right. We skipped around a little bit. So Clear Channel comes into the market. Yep. And starts buying up European promoters left and right. Well, no, 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 no. It was Bob Silliman with SFX. SFX, excuse me. Before it was Before Clear, Channel. Clear Channel. Okay, right. He so, sold to Clear Channel. Right, right, right. So Silliman bought, comes over and buys a ton of promoters. And Rapino winds up coming over and trying to get everybody to, I don't know, row the same direction. Yes. You in the system at that point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was in a company that was acquired by SFX. Which company? Barry Clayman Concerts, BCC. Okay, okay so that's that's perfect. That's exactly yes. where we're at. Okay, so you're there, BCC gets bought out. Bought out, uh, along with MCP, which was Midland Concert Promoters, which was Tim Parsons, Stuart Galbraith was there, and they acquired, SFX acquired that company as well at the same time. So we were all in a London office together, sort of working together for the first time, which was quite interesting uh, because this was a new you know completely new strategy with apollo leisure which was the biggest theatrical company so basically Nederlander for europe exactly they had a one Nederlander partnership with the dominion which i believe Nederlander still owns okay so that was the only partnership they have but now they're the ambassador theater group which is They've bought all, they bought, purchased all of those theaters from Apollo Leisure. So that we had all of those theaters as well as a uh, theatrical side, which put on touring shows, which uh, ran out of the same office. And we had a soccer agent's business, which was on the top floor. These were the things that Silliman had acquired in the UK. It was quite interesting days. You'd have David Beckham coming in because his agent was in in up on the third floor. Oh, that's so, fun. Yeah, he was when he was playing in those days, and we were uh, working out of Gloucester Place, which is just where the old American Embassy used to be, and we were uh, going through. Obviously, when Silliman went to Clear Channel and and did that deal, Clear Channel was a different type of company, as you well know. That's uh, Billboard Radio's TV. Uh, they spun us off, which is where Live Nation came from. And that was Michael was heading that up. All right. So that's what, like going on 11, 12 years? Yeah. No, yes. That, no longer, actually. Um, I'm trying to think now how long Live Nations existed. Uh, I remember the Live Nation 10 hats came out a while ago, yes. but it's been well over a year, yeah, I think. No, so. Okay. Yes. That's, that's so it. somewhere in the ballpark. Yes, but exactly. Definitely over a decade. Yeah. So I've been there from, from that time. Yes. I was there from the beginning. But through all the, all many different, transitions, many yes. different business cards. Through. Yes, absolutely. Well, we'll not changing too much. Okay. Absolutely. So all of your competitors at one place, that had to be a weird thing. Yep. Guys like Stewart, Toby Layton Pope was here at one point, Steve yes. Homer, which now obviously Kilimanjaro is doing a lot of volume in yes, the market. Yes, doing very well. You've got AEG who's doing a ton of volume, yep. especially with their park series at Hyde Park. Yep. And those guys have gone off. So all these guys that you, uh, you guys were all on the same team. You guys all had the same playbook. Yep. And now they're, uh, they're, they're using it across time. You're competing with guys that you used to have coffee with every Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Well, I still have coffee with them. I can still compete with them, but I just I can still have coffee as well. It's got to change it a little bit when guys that know you that well, because they've spent that much time with you, are now competing with you. Uh, yeah, but it's that's life. These things change. They move different aspects of it. You might need to, uh, okay, I've got to re-strategize or rethink how I'm going to do this, how I'm going to make that offer or not make that offer. I, I, I don't think there's necessarily any espionage that goes on. It evens out. Just hope that you can convince everybody the, the pluses that you have from from us having an incredible marketing situation here to to knowing what we're doing and moving forward. Hope that that, that wins us the deal. Um, you're not going to win every deal, but you certainly want to try. Now, the revenue streams over here are much different. Yes. The insides. I'm not going to go into exactly which, but the, in the States, they tend to be better in general. I believe so, yeah. And over here, it tends to be a little tighter. Ticketmaster's not in every room, and no. 
the ticketing is split up between every the, venue has uh, has their own ticketing. Right. So you've got a, a, usually a home ticketing system that's doing the accounting of who's, but everybody gets allotments to change, and exactly. they, they keep moving them around. You get, which, you get allocations, which is even harder because yeah. you get into the reserve seated venues. Absolutely, it, you have to know exactly which tickets are with what system because you can't double. At least with a GA room, yeah, you can just move numbers around. But no, we've got to be, we've got to be pretty much on with the box office to know yes. what we're doing, especially when you have an allocation system that the venue says, okay, we're going to split. 70, 30, 60, 40 with you. You're taking the lower end. Uh, by the way, you're taking out all the holds from yours. So if the artist has holds that he wants to hold, maybe as a sponsor, maybe he has his own VIP program, maybe he has a reason that he wants to hold back tickets, y- your allocation is diminished, whereas the venue then has a full allocation with no holds whatsoever, and they, they can go on and sell them. Now, I get it that they're trying to earn extra revenue, but in many instances they don't sell as well as we do so then we end up having the battle of getting more tickets off of them right because you, you sell out fairly quickly because yes. you got the marketing eh? exactly because we're pushing it it's a frustration but it's we know about it and i don't see it changing that quickly so we just have to make the best of it so people would say it's it's a different place in the world it's a different system you just have to deal with it but i imagine when in the artist case when trying to convince them to leave the states and play the other market trying to be as competitive as possible, showing them the best deal. It's hard when you're competing. You're not competing apples to apples. No, not at all. I mean, out of, it's your daily take, fight, right? Let's take the UK, for instance. We have 20% VAT. So whatever our gross is. That's tax. That's tax. 20% tax off the top before you do anything. So if you've got a gross of 100000 suddenly you're staring at 80000 And in a normal market, usually 10 would be high, but you see 10 in the States. You don't usually see much past that. Canada, no. sometimes 15 Usually five to ten is usually the safe ballpark. Sometimes so nothing. We're at twenty. We have our PRS, uh, uh, performing rights, or ASCAP, as it would be in America, or, or right. all those others. GMR, whatever. G- yeah. uh, th- that's four point two percent here. So suddenly you're very close to twenty five percent coming off the top before you can make an offer, before you can pay the venue, pay marketing, or, uh, or anything. So yes, we are. We're up against it. And if it's if it is an attraction that's coming from America, and I want to see dollars. It doesn't, you know, you've only got to look at the exchange rate with everything that's been going on politically for the last two years to know that the, the pound is pretty weak against the dollar. You make me not want to do shows in the UK. <laughs> well, that's oh why we've got to make sure that our personality and our interesting behavior keeps people coming. That's what we got to do. Hope they like fish and chips. Yeah. <laughs> and a pint of beer. Now, I always find it interesting, and we've talked about it on the podcast before, that when acts come to a country... They demand to be paid in dollars instead of the local currency. And I think that's a little rude. It's like me coming to your house and demanding that you cook a hamburger yeah. instead of the, the local cuisine. I think it's a little rude. I'm a guest in your country. <laughs> uh, You've invited uh, me. Uh, I can exchange your money anywhere in the world. What's the difference? Yeah. I always find it a little weird and uh, a little rude. I'm, I'm not, I don't see it as rude. What, where, where I see it is that obviously their economics are run, if, especially an American act, their economics are run by the dollar. So for them, it's far easier for someone to sit there and say, okay, they are doing apples for apples because they want to look at dollars to dollars. Sure. It does get interesting when you're trying to say, yes, we've actually grossed more this year than we grossed on your last tour, but we can, we, we're going to pay you less. That, that really is a mind bender because Unfortunately, our rate has gone down so far that we, we it, it just doesn't compute. We don't, we're not being able to pay you the same as we paid your guarantee last year, even though the gross is lower, purely because the dollar has dropped or the pound has dropped 20 cents on the dollar, which it has done. You know, it's, it's 124 today or something. And it, 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 two years ago, we were, we were in the 152s, 154. It doesn't take a lot to work out what that means to the to the deal. It makes it tough. And it also, I imagine, makes the UK acts want to head over to the States. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Because for them, it's they're getting paid that much more. Yeah. When they change it back to the pounds, yes, of course. At some point, they'll do. Yeah, one assumes that they will. And, and with an act coming here, we have withholding taxes, as you, as you do in America. But, you know, when you've got withholding taxes as well, that's a whole... Yes, in theory, there's a reciprocal agreement that, that they get the money back, but... It just makes it. You've got to try and make sure that you're. Suddenly, we understand why sticks stop coming over. Yeah, 
You, you've got to try and make it a lot of reasons to get past all of that, let's say, negative stuff. To, you've got to make sure you've got plenty of positives to make people want to come and be here. A whole lot of goes into what is just entertainment, trying Absolutely. to get people to buy a beer, a ticket, and relax yeah. for a minute. Yeah, just so they can go and enjoy themselves, how much we put into it to do it. How many tours are you overseeing on a given year? Oh, wow. I guess it's into the 20s of major tours. And a major tour you consider what, like 20 plus dates at uh, least? Yeah, certainly 12 up. Okay. Depending on, on how much time the accident is. Exactly. Give you. And if, you know, whether you're looking at a stadium tour or you're looking at an arena tour, obviously, because it's last Coldplay tour, for instance, with stadiums that I did, that was 18 through Europe. Simon and Bob look after Coldplay in the UK. I'm across it but obviously steve strange and josh are the agents for them but we put the european run together with them that's how we've uh, worked in the last few tours and those are playing big stadiums yes yes they're incredible band rolling multiple stadium dates is a weird new thing yes we've seen the last i don't know, call it five years that we're starting to see this where bands will sit down in a stadium for a couple nights now yep and in the case of what spice girls did three at Wembley, yes. The idea of an act ever selling a stadium is mind-blowing. It started happening in the 80s and 90s a little bit. An act to be able to do two and blow through them and possibly now a third, and you're seeing it with bands like U2 in major markets. Yep. And, well, look at Ed Sheeran. But Ed's done I mean, it's just, he's off the chart. It's unbelievable. But the idea of these massive acts keeping that much market share is unheard of. Yeah. I think one of the things that also is huge, I hope, is when you look when Ed's been through Europe like he has this year, I've had BTS in the UK, Simon and myself with the Spice, uh, Bon Jovi, uh, Eagles, Fleetwood Mac, Billy Joel, and yet all of those tickets, people have still bought all of those tickets. They've still come to see those shows. That The market, the, the amount of tickets just in the summer in the UK alone was, was incredible. You did two nights with BTS, right? Yes. Same stadium? Yes. Wembley. When you're putting that up, and it's a risk. Yeah. What's going through your head? Let's roll the dice. What the hell? Or Yeah. I, I, I it it we, ought to be there. Like, exactly. You, there's obviously, you have your gauges and your... And your barometers that you look at but you're just going on gut at that point of course you are with with a lot of money that's a different different situation and sure you can look at their uh, youtube views on just one song 54 million you say well maybe this is uh maybe this is a good risk to be in but even so because you can't look at the standard chart stuff that's happened here because until recently they've they haven't done any real chart action or anything like that record sales or or you just have to feel that it's uh, the the groundswell. You watch it, you look at the socials, which is where the new marketing is coming from. You've got to get in and learn that and and, and try and see the signs of where these things are. Um, we put that first show up and it, it, it was incredible. It went out in 45 minutes and that was only just because the system, maybe 50 minutes, the system was just taking its time because... There's so much volume, it couldn't yeah, handle it. And, and the kids were going on and... They were uh, not really reading the, in their in their f- absolute panic to buy tickets. They weren't really reading anything. They were just clicking to get through, get through, get through, and then they get it's somewhere. The way we used to dial, and trying they, to get to the phone centers and, and in the eighties. When they realized that no, that was the wrong one, they'd abort and start again. So it just took time. So we knew we were going to add the second show. We we took a week in between so that we would do. And we spent four days educating the kids on how to navigate the website. And when we went up with that second show, we sold out in 20 minutes quicker than we did the first show because suddenly they'd realized how to navigate. So was part of this that these kids hadn't bought a ticket through Ticketmaster before? Well, most of them. These are new. Maybe. These are new clients. Or they'd never done it in such a panic because it was a and and desperation to, say, to get tickets exactly and the, the on the night the two shows the fans were incredible they were so nice it was it was it was lovely to watch they would could you would you move over there? yes of course thank you it was all so polite it was such a great show now my understanding was this wasn't just particularly an asian audience that no, came out to see them all. not at all it was a real broad brush it was families it was it, there was no no particular genre at all it was everybody had come yeah of course we had asian fans they traveled to see it but there was you know it was a very big british base uh and and, and other european cities and they knew every word 
every dance move. They just got into it. The band went on a, at something like uh, uh, 7.30, didn't come off until 10.30, three-hour show. That's no amazing. Simple. And it was a spectacular show. It's just amazing when you start looking at stuff like that and the risks that are involved. Yep. And those were high-grossing shows. Very. And when I say high-grossing, I mean high-grossing for stadiums. Divide them by two and still look at the gross, and that's way higher than most stadium shows are. And Absolutely. I'm, I'm comparing them to acts that play stadiums. Yes. They're, those were super expensive super, tickets. Super, super. And it was, you know, the, they... I'd slightly lowered one of the prices, two of the prices than we'd done in the arena because we'd played the arena the year before, did two nights at the O2, and that just went out so quick. And obviously that was my gauge for going into the stadiums. But just to make sure that we were getting to everybody so that it, we weren't excluding anyone. So the ticket prices were a good spread, uh, and every single one was bought. It was, uh, it was fabulous. Sold out both shows. So going from acts like that to ELO, Justin Timberlake, it's all over the board. Yeah, and obviously they're completely different again on how you would market those things. When the research gets involved, or say the guys from Drake is coming over, yep. all of these dates, and London, almost anything is going to sell. It's like, it's like New York or LA yep. or Chicago. It's such yep. a massive population yep. base. Yep. Things are going to sell here. Yep. But I, I would imagine Leeds and Manchester start to get a different vibe of how well it's going to do, and you, you're a little more concerned with yeah. maybe those plays. But that's, that's being a promoter. If, if it was easy, then I don't think any of us would do it. That's the crazy world we're in. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's knowing that I think I can get into, uh, look at Leeds, look at Manchester, you've got Liverpool. Do I play Liverpool as well as Manchester? Can this act? You know, can they can they do both venues? Which are it, it, if you if you stick a pin in the middle of them, it's not twenty five minutes between each. You know, I can get the Manchester in twenty five minutes and get the Liverpool. Point. So you you got to work it out. Same thing with Leeds going across the top. It's only an hour over there, so you have to think about how uh, planning your routing. Do it. There's, there's still a lot of stuff to go in there. The the markets like pop. This oh, I know this market likes pop. Ah, oh, this market, yep. They're definitely into the heritage. It always sells very well. You just—it's all of those things that you've built, experiences that you've got that you can hopefully put into use when you go to promote there. Now there are things that I have been made aware of. I've spent a good amount of time over here, spent yeah, the last no, five no, or six no, years, well. and really tried to educate myself on this market. There are things I think we think forget about as Americans that you guys have your own heritage acts too. Yep. Guys like Rick Astley that yes. are much bigger here. Like he's probably a Rick Springfield kind of yes, yeah, act yeah. here where he can sell five to 12,000 tickets depending on the market. There is more traffic locally that you guys have your own homegrown artist base. And you would figured we'd know that because ELO, the Beatles, yeah. the Who, the Stones were all brought to us from you guys. But, you know, I think sometimes we forget yep. that, you know, all the acts don't necessarily come from us. But with the amount of traffic that you guys are importing, which is a solid amount of your business, yep. there's still a good amount of local business from the, Europe. Uh, brings us back to the domestic side. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, and, and you need to be doing those acts. They sell tickets. There's, there's artists in, look at Italy as a market, for instance. I don't know why I'm grabbing Italy, but you can go to Italy and there are Italian acts that will do multiple stadiums vasco rossi will play multiple stadiums i've had the the pleasure of of playing vasco rossi in london and i did hammersmith in the territories it, they mean different things so it's always good to get in and find that and it's the same here i have we have domestic acts that i can sell a re, an arena tour here that I wouldn't even be able to sell theaters in other territories. So it's, it, it, you just have to make sure that you're, you've, you're still running those because as I said before, it's all about working and, and, and using your, your business, the, the machinery to keep it going. Now you oversee a bunch of markets that have a bunch of different languages. Yes. Now I've, I've experienced this in Canada, especially when you go up north towards Quebec. Where if French is a thing. French is the thing. They yep. try, you know, there's a French language show. There's an English language show. But you get over here and you've got so many different languages based on the different regions, territories. And I imagine there's different artists that perform solely in one language or another. And based on the population and where the languages are stronger, that's got to be a whole mind fuck too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, everybody kind of speaks English a little, but it seems yeah, no, like they do. English is definitely the, the 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 common denominator through all those. We things. appreciate you guys speaking our language over here yeah, too. Thank that, you. That's real nice. Of you. Um, obviously, the French, well known that 
French singing artists that are very strong in, in France. And if you're going to go in as a, not necessarily as one of the super uh, artists, if you're going in at that arena level, it doesn't hurt you to to put a French song in the show. That'll always go but down well. And it expands well. out, right? Because in Brussels, that's a big thing too, I picked yes. up. But then there's a different language in Antwerp, which is what? Diamond? 45, 45 minutes down the road. Yeah, diamonds. <laughs> 45 minutes down the road. Uh, what do they speak know, there? Flemish. French is very strong in, in Brussels and moving down to the south of Belgium. But in, in Antwerp, it's Flems, it's Flemish, which is uh, another language at all, which then runs you into to the Dutch in Holland. Right, and you got Germany right up there, and that's yeah. completely different. Absolutely. You know, strong Some accents. things work in Munich that don't work in Hamburg. And, you know, they they really do have a, an expanse. So that's uh, that's it's it's all of those things you have to find. And, and holidays, just a thing like holidays. It's, in Northern Europe, Summer starts a lot earlier than it does in Southern Europe. And it finishes quicker in Northern Europe than it does in Southern Europe. And you got to so, know that because you got to know if the population base is going to be in town. Yeah, if they're going to be there. I mean, now in Scandinavia, we're starting to get towards the end of their holidays. I mean, it'll, it'll be the second week of August, but it's coming. Whereas in Spain, it'll be the second week of September. So it's when you're putting that, uh, the on sales, the routing, all of those things, it's about where you can go. But it matters on the front end in, as you probably know, in Scandinavia, come the 21st of June, that's it. Everyone's done. That's Midsummer's Day. Thank you very much. Everyone's off work. They've checked out. Well, you've also got everybody's on holiday over here. People take... They take vacation. 10 days to two weeks, yep. but everybody does everybody it some Everybody does it. And it's different parts of the, Europe. People do it at different times. Yep. And you got to know, yep. I would liken it to trying to put up a football game in Texas against college or high school football on a Friday or Saturday. And if you didn't know that stuff, you could you could be going to town versus going up against a church on Sunday. You yeah. got to know or you're going to pay the price. Yeah. And it's, it's insane because every different region seems to be a little different. That's in the same way in the languages, you've got to know what, what's going to work for you. It isn't one of the, the things about America and the, the beauty of the states is it's such a vast country. But you're dealing with one currency, one language, whereas we have many currencies outside of the euro. Of course, there's still territories that don't use the euro, but the pound, for instance, and they're different the nuances. And they can have a, they can be the smallest country that sits next to the 50 miles or something away from that. The two cities, the two major cities are 50 to 100 miles, but there'd be different nuances between those two. It's, you've got to try and learn all of those things when you're promoting because you're selling tickets and you've got to make sure that everything is in your favor. It's why go and do something when someone says, well, you shouldn't really be doing it. I had a discussion this morning about some shows that we're going to do. And uh, I was dealing with some Canadians about the shows that we're going to do next year. There is a big European soccer event that happens here through the summer. And they said, you know, we're going to keep Mondays dark, but unless you tell us, Phil, that maybe there's a football match, a soccer match on the Thursday that we should stay clear of, then maybe we can add to Monday and, and stay clear of the Thursday because they're going to be playing in a particular country that is involved in the Euros. So it's all of those little things that you have to think about and go forward just to be planning. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> now, <laughs> the so. only other thing on top of that that we have yet to mention is it happens to everyone. Not every tour sells. No, exactly. So on top of all of this other then variables you're at risk that have to as well. play, yeah, you still have to find enough tours to make up for the bad tours. Yeah, well, to you not know, only cover you, one, those. one bad one. Well, needs, what about three good ones, right? Exactly. At least three. Right. So on top of all that, you got to be doing enough volume to cover the losses and the marginals. Yep. Cover the staff, the overhead, which yep. ain't included in the deal. And somehow make up for it. Yep. When do you fucking sleep? <laughs> now I know why you need two weeks well, of holiday. It's, it's, it, it's interesting. You find yourself. The holidays are a great word. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to sound like a martyr here. But yes, I will go on a break with the family. But I, I don't stop. You can't. You, 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 you are constantly thinking. Now, if you try and get a balance, then hopefully you're not. So stressing. you're checking in while you're away. Exactly. I have familiar I, with this. I, I carry a computer. I carry the iPad. I carry everything so that I can. And if I want to spend, depending on time, if I'm away in time differences and things like that, I'll I'll designate times that I can sit there and just. Well, do sure, it. you're in a service business. Yeah, exactly. How much time do you wind up spending 
interacting with the global guys and the guys in the U.S. that do touring? Is it you? Are you talking to Ryan and Omar daily? Yes, not daily. We try and talk as much as we can, and and I'm a great believer in that because information, knowledge that that's that's such a key part of what we do, and just talking to people. Uh, Rick, Rick Franks. I talk to Rick a lot, and and. And just just to gauge what the business is and certain things, there might be an artist that you're not even thinking about bringing, but there could be a genre that you want to work together and look at and think, okay, that's a similar. I can draw some similarities with that, so I can look at what that's doing and how it's doing. And it's, it, it, I think, communication is the best, is especially in a company like us where we have the ability to to choose those offices to talk to and we have the, the the wherewithal i can pick the phone up and talk to any of our offices and and that's for me is a great piece of uh, of our business that's that's a good thing for us to have something very pleasing of the visual view and rick frank's hanging out yeah <laughs> i've got a great picture of simon moran rick frank's dennis arthur myself and billy joel I'll have to show that to you. That's an awesome hand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was after Billy's, or just before Billy's show at Wembley this year. Now, there's an American that I imagine sells some tickets over here when he comes over. Yes. He, he's, he's been very... Selective? Yes. Exclusive. I don't think it's a secret that he's not, you know, he doesn't want to tour and bang out dates and no, do all of those things. picking every show yeah, regardless. Exactly. I mean, the, the one Unless the it's MSG month, every three yeah, weeks. Uh, that's a different thing right. because that's, you know, that's... Hometown that's, residency. That's, yeah, that's special. Incredible. Right. Uh, having been and seen him there it is just another thing. But, yeah, he's he, so because he's been selective, because, you know, he's not going to... Uh, he doesn't need to do that every... He wants to come when he, when he feels it's right. So it, it's been, you know, it's stadium now. It's that's the business he does here. So Wembley's how many tickets when you sell it out? In the configuration that we put Billy in, because we seated the pitch, it's just on sixty thousand. Bon Jovi did seventy six thousand people in it without seats on the pitch, obviously this year. It's an amazing business that he's been doing across Europe. Yeah. I saw some of those pictures from Israel the other night. That's yeah, yeah, that was insane. the last last day of the tour. Moving forward, what's the vision? What what's the goal? What's left for me personally? Yeah, uh, doing what I'm doing, enjoying everything. The minute I don't enjoy it, then obviously it's not not something you want to do. You you shouldn't want to do. But I'm loving everything I do, and just yeah. Just keep keep going, keep doing the same thing. See if I, how many acts we can find. Sell that another way of selling that ticket. That's I, I get very excited about marketing opportunities. It's, it, 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 we have a very very young, good, fresh marketing team, and I I love challenging them. Okay, come on, come up with some ideas. It, it, just not to to knock them down, but just to to get that feel from them. Where are they thinking? How are they doing? We have a great digital team. Because they're not, I've been a, a promoter of Neil Diamond for a very long time, and, and I'm not sure that Neil will work again, But that, which is quite sad. But if I go to sell Neil Diamond tickets, yes, I, I would go to uh, the Evening Standard, the Daily Mail, that's a newspaper advertising, that's it. If I'm going to One Direction, I'm not going near the newspapers. That's completely social media. So it's learning the differences and getting, making sure you're having the same impact on all of the different outlets to, to sell the tickets. That's, I get a buzz out of that, finding another, ah, look at this. Look at the response that's had. When you see, when you do something, you try it and suddenly there's a, there's a jump in ticket sales there. For me, that's a, a you know a great feeling. That's satisfaction. That works. Click, copy, repeat. Let's do more of that. Exactly. And, and to keep finding those things to do it. Now, you just said for Neil Diamond, you would use print. And yes. for an artist similar to that, you yeah. still would, right? Now, the UK is still stronger in print-based media yeah, than the it, States. It still exists. It does. In, it's going in a very a relative le level, though. It, it's going off a little bit. But what you do gain, it's, it, it's almost most of those print now run a website. So if you're in the print, you actually pick up on the website as well. So you sort of covered a couple of bases not that the kids are necessarily going to start looking at that particular copy online but at least you're there so that you're putting it out with the the digital tv still strong strong medium and always will be particularly on those middle of the road acts that people are watching on the tvs you pick one of those tv shows run the ad during it especially if it's a, a an on-sale announcement or something a big big noise type ad always you know helps every time um and you still get the feel 
every time you go on sale, you know exactly what, what's happening. Do you have any advice for any of the young kids coming up in the business for career longevity? Yeah. Keep doing it and ask. Ask questions. You know, I've, I've made a point of uh, being available to any of the guys here. Not, I'm not saying I know everything. Far from it. Because if you ever think that, then you should, you should quit. But there could have been examples or, or it's another another way of looking at something which just opens up the window a little bit more. It's, oh, okay. It, it just gives a little bit more light into what you're trying to do. So don't give up. Just keep asking questions and use that, store that information because you'll need it again. You'll come back to it and use that to not negate problems, but at least, ah, don't don't look about something like as a brick wall. Oh, there is a way I can't. There is a door I can go around it and get through it. I've done it before. Thank you so much for making time and talking to Thank you, me. Dan. It's been a pleasure for me and obviously enjoyed my time and enjoy seeing you. Bill is simply as big as it gets when it comes to tour promoting. That's it. That's the top of the fucking mountain. Yeah. Phil Bowdry, ladies and gentlemen. Holy shit. Mitch Blackman from ICM on Promoter 101 with Dan Steinberg. We are so thrilled to announce that we've teamed up with the Recording Academy's Music Care Foundation to do a little good. You, our listeners, can help right now by going to Promoter101.net, clicking on the Merch button at the top of the browser, and picking a very stylish Promoter 101 t-shirt or hoodie. Donate $20 for the t-shirt, $50 for the hoodie, 100% of the proceeds goes to Music Care. It's all tax deductible. There is no additional shipping or handling. We take care of it all for you. Buy a shirt, support some people in need. It's the very first shirt we've ever done, and we're very, very, very proud of it. It features all of our stops during conferences, our live taping and podcasts, a great piece of memorabilia for all the Promoter 101 fans out there. And as we mentioned in our previous podcast, we're very excited to partner with Prism, who is matching the first $10,000 of gross proceeds in sales and donations through our website at Promoter101.net. So if you donate 20 bucks, that instantly becomes 40 through the matching program through Prism. So go on Promoter101.net right now. Get yourself a t-shirt, get yourself a hoodie, and the first $10,000 of gross will be matched by Prism, and it'll all go to Music Cares. So if you buy a hoodie for 50 bucks, that's $100 of good you just did. And Music Cares, a phenomenal organization run by some amazing people doing great work, not just for musicians, not just for working artists out there, but they do a great deal for music industry professionals in their lives as well, too. So many of the industry folks that are out there listening to this, if you don't know what Music Cares is, please take the time visit their website, learn more about the organization. And if you want any more information about it, Dan and I would be more than happy to connect you with some great folks over at that organization. So hit us at steiny at promoter101.net and we'll get you all the information you need about it. And you got many, 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 many colors and styles to choose from between the t-shirts and the hoodies. It's great. If you like the baseball shirt, we got that. If you like the ringer, you got that. So many things. You don't have to be worried about being at the next conference and being seen in the same thing as everybody else. So many things to choose from. If you are traveling a lot like Dan and I, I got to say this hoodie is excellent for airplanes. So comfortable, so soft, keeps you nice and warm on those flights where they cool things down at 35,000 feet. Get yourself one, 50 bucks right now. That'll be 100 bucks through our partnership with Prism. It all goes to Music Care as a great organization. And I just want to point out, 100% of the gross, every cent that you give, go into Music Cares. Get yourself a t-shirt. That'll do it. That's the end of our broadcast day. Everything here, wrapping up an episode 181 of Promoter 101. So thank you so much for tuning into this podcast. Thank you to our amazing listeners out there. And to today's guest, the executive president of Touring International, Phil Bowdry, coming in from Live Nation and AEG presents Rocky Mountains, Chuck Morris, two legends on this podcast today. A lot of weight on one show. A lot of weight on one show, Dan, and, and I hope that everybody enjoyed it. And if you did, we want to hear about it. Email us at steiny at promoter101.net with your thoughts, with your questions. Let us know your feedback. We want to hear from you. We'll be back Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Standard, 8 p.m. on the Eastern Seaboard. That's where they keep New York and D.C. That's where they keep it up. Join us then. We're going to have a featured interview with CA Nashville's Bobby Corey, who represents acts like Heim, Glass Animals, Leon Bridges, Harry Styles, The Head and the Heart. Just to name a few, Dan, that's going to be a killer interview. I'm really looking forward to that. Until then, we're wishing you sold out shows for the weeks to come. Cheers. Call your mother. Paul Higginson, Live Nation Canada, here on Promoter 101.